Testing. Logo rise. Yeah, thanks for coming out tonight. So we've got a busy night again tonight, uh, last sort of regular meeting for the year. So we're going to have a quick roundup of association business. Then our feature, uh, one of two features of, on Apollo 12. And then we've got a really interesting presentation, which is actually a video and, a, and an accompanying presentation I've done uh, with uh, Australia's very own Brian O'Brien, uh, who um, has a fascinating story about Apollo as experiments on the moon as we speak. Then we're going to take a break at about 8.30 to have a chat, walk around, say hello to somebody you haven't met before. 
and then we've got our first part of uh, Plan 2 News. We've got Andrew Rennie coming up first on this one, because we always put him last. He seems to run out of time, so he gets first slot after the break. And then uh, Angelo de Grazia, when he eventually turns up, will do his presentation at 9.30. And then the kick is out at 10. So without further ado, uh, some, intro some news about the association. We've um, become aware of this um, um, public forum mini, they call it, the Moon Villages Association. We, we did an event with them at the start of this year uh, down at, um, at uh, Federation Square and uh, they had some interesting speakers uh, and we were involved a little bit there. So they've got another one this coming February. I've got the dates at the end of this. So the idea is they're all about Moon Village and settling on the moon and that sort of thing. Um, so they've got some good speakers, Alice Gorman, Dr. Alice Gorman, uh, Kurdwin Dubby, uh, Gabriel Harris and Donna with it, and they've got an unnamed speaker. There's supposed to be five speakers, so should be quite interesting. We'll give you more details about that. It is free. Uh, however, you need to book on Eventbrite. There's um, 60 slots. Um, actually, yeah, sorry. 60 spaces uh, seating and 200 standing. So I don't know whether you've seen this place called the um, M Pavilion in the Queen Victoria Gardens opposite the National Gallery of Victoria. It's kind of like an open air sort of thing. I don't know. Has anyone been there? I, I haven't. So um, anyway, I looked up this afternoon, there's a number of the seats, so the se seating spots, there's only about 30 left, there's 60 available, and there's about 180 odd standing spots. So if you want to go ahead and do that, do a search um, and uh, get along, might be interesting. Um, other things? Yeah. Female gender and bias towards or? Gender, okay, that's interesting. The gender bias, <laughs> okay. Interesting. I well, might have been having that discussion about uh, why the Apple TV for mankind thing is named mankind. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Alright, well, uh, that should be interesting. Well, well maybe we can go and equalise the. Uh, the field there. Um, so once again we do run our weekly radio show with Andrew Rennie over here, uh, Southern FM. We also have um, a group of us do a weekly um, uh, podcast in a part of that, so we get included. Come and take a seat if you feel like, we're happy, quite happy to stand, no worries. Uh, public meetings, live streams, etc. Uh, I've had some preliminary discussions with the Sun Theatre about doing something in April for April Apollo 13. Apollo 13. They all over it. They want to do, they want to do something. Um, so watch this space. Um, even if it ends up being running Tom Hanks on the big screen and doing some other things around it, uh, but we might see them cook up something else as well. I know that uh, the tracking community here in Australia, who are having something like the place, is really the places, we have scrambled during Apollo 13, so we can get some stories involved in it. Um, what was that for suggestions on either things to do, things to talk about, speakers, if you've got somebody, if you've got somebody, if you've got things, or if you've got somebody, 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 if you've got for the year, and next meeting is the 16th of December, not the 4th of November, uh, and it's going to be a trivia month, so people have been along to that before. Um, Tim is in charge of the trivia, so I'll have a drink, he wanted to get friends on home with uh, valuable prizes and glorious uh, statuses. Um, we have um, the discussions with the venue here, the, the uh, Gate Hotel. Hotel. Uh, we do have clearance to continue at this venue next year on the same schedule. So uh, I assume by the fact you're here, you're, you're pretty comfortable with that. Um, 
more news on all that. So the dates for that will be once again the fourth Monday of the month except for December. 14th of December is a kind of the second week in, so we'll confirm that during the year. But there's your dates there, so if you forget, it's the fourth Monday of the month. Alright. Once again, the next meeting is December 16th, not the fourth Monday, which is the week after. And once again, as always, we are a volunteer organisation, no one gets paid. The only way we can do any of these things is by um, using the funds that we get from our memberships and other activities. Oh, uh, there's a sheet of paper up there if you're not already on our Reader's Digest list, please put your name there. We've also got the last five t-shirts in the world available for sale here. There's two smalls and two extra smalls. I'm wearing a small, so it ain't that small. So if you want one, um, we're going to do them for $15. They were $30, but, but these are the last ones at the end of the year. If you want one, come and see Tim or myself, and we'll get that organised for you. It could be part of your summer slim-down uh, program to get into the extra small. There you go. There's the motivation for you. The Space Association delivers again. All right. That's enough for that. So um, we're going to sort of pick up the old thread of the old, uh, as people were probably familiar, the last, whole of last year and half of this year, we did the countdown to Apollo 11. Obviously that took place already, so we're just doing a one, a one little, uh, let me update that logo, uh, one little presentation on Apollo 12, which was obviously this month, 50 years ago, can you believe it? So we'll whiz through this. So this is the, uh, the patch, and I, someone did this the other day, which I thought was quite nice. Bit of an update there. Um, Pete, Dick and Al. So just a couple of uh, items on the schedule of what was happening. June the 23rd, Intrepid, the lunar module for Apollo 12, was being moved to the integration work stand. Um, Apollo, oh, so June 25th, the support crew member, Jerry Carr, who flew later on Skylab. Uh, Alan Bean, watching Pete Conrad checking. I didn't realise this, the PLSS batteries were outside of the lunar module on the descent stage, so they went down there to grab them and put them in the, in the plus which is kind of interesting. So you can see the, the TV camera there and there's the, the batteries. So how about that? So they would have had done one EVA to go and get the batteries for the second EVA, I assume. Pretty sensible, I suppose. Little things you learn, eh? Um, this is a picture of Pete and Al uh, examining the passive seismometer. Um, and a uh, rock box behind there. June 30, the command service module will top the adapter being driven to the VAB. August 2nd, they were doing their uh, landing training at the um, Langley Research Centre. September, I didn't get a date on this one, so I'm not sure the date. Please just see me later, but Pete and I were practising in the, in the flight crew training building, hand tool carrier, which they had on the left hand side there. And then we had the rollout on September 8 of the of vehicle to the pad. Continue on the EVA training, October 6th, photographing the surveyor mock-up. As the people probably were aware, the target for the mission was to land within walking distance of uh, the surveyor, which had landed, I think, a couple of years beforehand. October 22nd, Richard Gordon in the, commands, the command module simulator. All these heavy camera gear. Pete and Al in the lunar module training uh, bigger training. Lost my words. Yeah, the training device there, and you can see the um, the uh, lithium hydroxide candidates, which became famous in Apollo 13, of course, on the right hand side there. Um, Pete uh, Conway was flying the uh, the lunar landing training vehicle on October 25th. I don't think the command module, uh, the lunar module pilots actually flew the training vehicle. It was only the commanders. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. Only the commanders flew that. Anyone? Tim? Did only... You're not listening to my presentation? You'll get it. The commanders only flew the LA-TV? Sorry. It was a seven second Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. It was only the commanders that flew the LLTV, not the LMPs? I'm not aware of any of the... 
No, no, keep an eye on the pilot. Yeah. There we go. Um, so after the rollout, the crew are posing out the front of the Saturn V vehicle on the tow 29. Good thing about this crew, you always seem smiling when you see pictures of them. Uh, they did a uh, countdown de demonstration test on 20, October 29. And this is the actual launch day of to uh, November 14 at the crew breakfast with their, uh, with their mascot in the background there. And I like this picture. Pete Conrad getting suited up and uh, the technician's putting a sandwich in his, in his pocket there. <laughs> I like it. All right, so we get to launch day, pretty eventful day. Uh, not the cloudiest, uh, not the uh, most pristine day to, to launch a vehicle, but uh, quite eventful. So we're just going to go ahead and go to the video. Now this is the NASA, official NASA one. April 19, 1967, Surveyor 3 landed on the moon in a crater of Oceanus Procolorum, the ocean, ocean of, of storms. With Surveyor's electronic eye, we view the lunar surface. With its mechanical arm, we dug a small, shallow trench in the lunar soil. Now, on November 14, 1969, 31 months after surveyor's landing, men were leaving the Earth to land on the ocean of storms. Charles Pete Conrad, Richard Gordon, Alan Bean, the crew of Apollo 12, the second manned landing on the face of the moon. Their target, the site of Surveyor 3. Running, commit, lift off. Apollo 12 lifted off in the driving rain. Pete Conrad reports the York program is in. Tower clear. The pitch and a roll program and this baby is really going. 36 seconds later, lightning struck the spacecraft. Yeah, I don't know what happened here. We had everything in the world drop out. I'm not sure if you get my lightning. Fuel cell lights and AC bus light, fuel cell disconnect, AC bus overload one and two, main bus A and B out. Okay, we're all organized again, Jack. We've had a couple of cardiac arrests down here too, Pete. Hey, I'll tell you one thing, it's that first class ride, Houston. Gotta go, Orbit, you're looking good. In space and on Earth, they checked out the systems to be sure that the lightning had caused no damage that would endanger the mission. The time for commitment neared, the burn to send Apollo 12 to the moon. Translunar injection, TLI. Apollo 12, Houston, the good word is your go for TLI. Hoopy doo, we're ready. We didn't expect anything else. We didn't train for anything else, Pete. You better believe it. We have data and thrust is go. Burn looks good. With engine cut off, Apollo 12 was on its way to the moon. Now they turned around to dock with the lunar module and pull it free of the now useless booster. Houston, she looks good. The next burn would place Apollo 12 on a new path to the moon. Previous missions had followed a trajectory that would allow them to loop around the moon and with no further burns return to Earth. But Apollo 12, in order to land at the proper site with the proper lighting, would break out of the free return path. 
Should a failure occur, a burn of the service or lunar module engine would be needed to get them home. Seven, six, five, landing 99, zero, two, one, ignition front. My ball valve. Okay. Other ball valve. Three, four, five, very six. Six. Very good. Now they settle down to the routine of the outward flight. We're trying all these things that we didn't have in Gemini, like toothpaste and shaving, and uh, we're really having a ball up here. Roger. All dressed up and no place to go. Oh, we're going someplace. We can see it get bigger and bigger all the time. Then, on November 17th, they prepared for orbit around the moon. Our uh, motion to the left is not as apparent as our motion towards the moon, and therefore we have the decided impression that we're going right into the center of that baby right now. Okay, Houston, we're maneuvering to the burn attitude. Rod, we copy that, 12. We're beginning to uh, go into darkness at this time. Roger, 12. Matter of fact, we're there. Hello, 12. Houston, your go for LOI. Roger, Houston, go for LOI. Burn checklist is complete to minus six minutes, and we're holding a dead point. LOI, Lunar Orbit Insertion. The burn of the spacecraft rocket engine that would place Apollo 12 into orbit around the moon. With this burn occurring behind the moon, there would be no communications with the spacecraft until it came over the lunar horizon. The command module, Yankee Clipper, the lunar module, Intrepid. Apollo 12, Houston. Hello, Houston. Yankee Clipper with Intrepid in tow has arrived on time. I guess like everybody else that just arrived, they're all three of us are plastered to the windows looking. The next day, Pete Conrad and Alan Bean entered the lunar module, leaving Dick Gordon in the command module. Now the Intrepid and Yankee Clipper undocked and separated, preparatory to Intrepid's descent and landing on the moon. Okay, here you go again. Maybe. Back off, Dick. There he goes. Okay, Houston, the sim running pretty smooth today. Permanent, Pete. As with the orbit insertion burn, the burn to begin descent was made behind the moon. Mission Control again contacted Intrepid as it came over the horizon. The Intrepid Houston, how do you read? Hello, Houston Intrepid. Roger, we read you loud and clear. We had a great DOI burn. And yep. we just watched the first Earth rise, which was fantastic. The Surveyor 3 target was located in the middle of five craters, arranged like a snowman. The upper crater, called Head Crater. The body, called Surveyor Crater. Surveyor 3 is located in this crater. The object, to land as close as possible to Surveyor Crater. Then at 50,000 feet, Intrepid's engine fired and began the landing sequence. Okay, we're out of 19,000 feet. I got some kind of a horizon out there. I got some craters too, but I don't know where I am yet. Okay. And a buy for P-64. Okay. I'm trying to cheat and look out there. I think I see my crater. Hey, baby. I'm not sure. Coming through seven. Okay. P-64, P. P-64. Hey, there it is. There it is! Son of a gun! Right down the middle of the road! Outstanding! 42 degrees, Pete. Hey, it's sergeant right from the center of the crater. Look out there. I can't believe it. Amazing! Fantastic! 42 degrees, Pete. Just keep talking. Ride it in. Coming down at about 99 feet a second. You're looking good. Okay. Okay. Go for landing. Over one. Roger, okay, go. Roger. 40 degrees, LPD, Pete. 40 That's degrees. That's so fantastic, I can't believe it. You're at 2,000 feet. Boys on the ground do okay. 1,800 feet up, 
39 degrees, 38 degrees, 36 degrees, you're 1,200 feet, Pete. Okay, 1,000 feet coming down at 30. Looks good out there, babe, looks good. 32 degrees, you're at 800 feet. 33 degrees, 600 feet. Nice, hey, look right. at that crater right where it's supposed to be. Hey, you're beautiful. 240 coming down at 5. Hey, you're really maneuvering around. Yeah. Come on down, Pete. Okay. 10% fuel. 200 feet coming down at 3. You can come on down. Okay. 180 feet. 9%. You're looking good. Gonna get some dust before long. 96 feet coming down at 6. Slow down the descent rate. 80 feet, 80 feet coming down at 4. You're looking good. 50 feet coming down. Watch for the dust. 40 coming down at 2. Looking good. Watch the dust. Coming down at 2 feet. You got plenty of gas. Plenty of gas, dude. Hang in there. 30 seconds. 18 feet coming down at 2. He's got it made. Come on in there. 24 feet. Contact light. Roger. Copy contact. Pro. Yeah, pro. Okay. Engine arm off. Okay. I'll cycle these valves. You got your spinning command override off. Yep. The good That's thing we leveled big. off high. Yeah. And it came down because I sure couldn't see what was underneath us once I uh, got into that dust. It's a nice place to land. Look at those boulders out there on the horizon, Pete. Gee, my name. As Conrad and Bean began preparations for their first trip of exploration, men on Earth began their attempts to fix their exact landing site. They were aided by Dick Gordon, orbiting in Yankee Clipper. I have him coming. I have him coming. Well done, Clipper. using the 28 power sextant for these sightings. Roger, Clipper. Good eyeball. Well done. A major goal of Apollo 12 had been accomplished. For before men can engage in meaningful lunar exploration, they must be able to select a precise site and get there. But now it was time to exit the Intrepid and begin the exploration and experiments. Conrad climbed out first. Okay. Okay, I'm at the perch. Hey, I'll tell you where we're parked next to. Yeah. We're about 25 feet in front of the surveyor crater. It's good. I don't want it to be. I got. I, I bet you when I get down to the bottom of the ladder, I can see the surveyor. Okay. Down to the, the pit. Okay. Man, that may have been a small one for Neil, but that's a long one for me. Oh, you'll never believe it. That's what I see sitting on the side of the crater. The old surveyor, right? The old surveyor, yes, sir. <laughs> Does that look neat? It can't be any further than 600 feet from here. How about that? Now, Pete Conrad collected a preliminary geological sample. I had the decided impression I don't want to move too rapidly. But I can walk quite well. Seems a little weird, I'll tell you. But I don't think you're going to steam around here quite as fast as you thought you were. Hey, Al. You can work out here all day. Just take your time. Now Al Bean left Intrepid to join Conrad on the surface of the moon. where I landed, we'd have landed right smack in that crater.
Inadvertently, the television camera was pointed directly at the sun, causing the tube to burn out, the only unsuccessful aspect of the entire mission. They prepared an experiments package to be left on the moon, an automated scientific station called ALSEP that would send information to Earth for a year, powered by a nuclear electric generator. They moved to the site selected to set up the station. Hey, there's another one of those mounds over there. Where? Hey, you're right. What do you suppose they are? I don't know. It looks like a small volcano. They put together the experiment station. How far do you estimate we're from the lamp? 600 feet? 700 feet? ALSEP, an acronym for Apollo Lunar Surface Experiments Package. Piece by piece, they assemble the station. Okay. Can I get the uh, solar wind deployed here? The solar wind experiment, to measure atomic particles thrown off by the sun as they strike the moon. A device to measure the moon's tenuous atmosphere, a magnetometer to measure the lunar magnetic field, which would later be found to be 10 to 20 times stronger than many scientists had expected. A seismometer to measure physical properties of the crust and interior. And the data station to collect the experimental measurements and transmit them to Earth. With ALSEP deployed, Conrad and Bean began collecting geological samples. They drove a core tube into the surface to collect soil from various depths. Okay, I'm core tubing it right now. Kill. Harder it a bit and pound it. But now it's full length. We show you're uh, three hours and seven minutes into it, into the EVA. And we'd like you back uh, to the LEM to start the closeout in ten minutes. That's at three plus one seven. At the smoke to get back to that LEM, we're a long way. Houston, we're approaching the ALSAP, headed back to the LEM. Feet and Al, we're picking up uh, your heavy footprints going by the seismometer. Okay, and then we ought to dust each other off. Yeah, man, we are filthy. Okay, coming up the ladder. Gosh, you're shaking the whole room. Sorry about that. Yankee Clipper, Houston. Hello, Houston. Clipper here. Clipper, you were sort of the forgotten man for a little while. We're all, uh, all eyes are on you now. We're with you. As Dick Gordon circled the moon, Pete Conrad and Al Bean rested for their next expedition. Their total time on the lunar surface had been just under four hours. Twelve and a half hours later, they went out again. Copy, Pete. Before they began their geological expedition to the surrounding craters and to Surveyor, they worked around the lunar module, getting ready the tools and containers they would need. We're putting the uh, parts bag on uh, Pete right now, Houston. Roger, we copy that. And what happened since yesterday? I don't know. I think everybody learned to look okay. As Bean readied the equipment, Conrad went out to the ALSEP station to check an instrument about which the Earth-based scientists had shown some concern. I'll loop off to the ALSEP and check the size. I'll meet you at point one ahead crater. Houston, Pete's on his way to the ALSEP. 
After Conrad checked the ALSEP experiments, they began the geological traverse, during which they would cover about a mile and take samples from six craters. You get a big surprise when you look into this head crater, Al. It's a heck of a lot deeper than it looked, eh? There you go. That's, that's a good rock. Hey, look at the pits in it, too. That's just going to be a good rock, Houston. Okay, Houston, I'm coming up on Bench Crater right now. Boy, there's some big fragments of yeah, pictures. What a fantastic sight. Al, look at the bottom of that crater. Hey, here, here's some good rock samples right here. Come on. Why don't we stop here and look at the chart a little bit more closely? Man, does that limb look small back there? Pete now, we show you're 1,200 feet from the limb. Okay. You know what I feel like, Al? Yeah. You ever see those pictures of giraffes running in slow motion? <laughs> That's exactly what I feel like. <laughs> Got the decided feeling. I'm going to sleep tonight. Then they arrived at Surveyor, their target. While the Surveyor activities were a bonus, they were symbolic. Symbolic of the success of Apollo 12. Yeah, we're uh, just going to move to the area. Now, look, you can see which way it came in. See the way this gear pit dug in over there? Dug up dirt, and you're still sitting there. Okay, Houston, I, uh, I'm jiggling it. The Surveyor is firmly planted here. That's no problem. Okay, Al, we're ready to start getting a TV camera, okay? All right, you see that, that uh, material disintegrate? Hey, that cut easy. Okay, two more tubes on that TV camera, and that baby's ours. Done. There you go. In the bag, in the bag. Yeah, I gotta zip it up. Good show. Be How about let me cut this scoop off? Sure. Didn't think you were gonna leave without a scoop, did you? Let's head for Blackie Crater. So they left Surveyor, and after a stop at the crater called Block, they were back at the lunar module, collecting the solar wind experiment, stowing the rock boxes. It's really ridiculous. I got dust all over the rock box, and I'm trying to blow it off. Bean re-entered the lunar module first. Conrad, using a transfer apparatus similar to a clothesline reel, sent the samples up to him. Then, Conrad, too, left the lunar surface. Okay. Houston, uh, if you can mark me off the lunar surface. Roger, we got that, Pete, at uh, three hours and 50 minutes into the EVA. Yeah, yep, the roll ladder I come. I hope, I hope. <laughs> but there was no time to rest. The lunar module had to be prepared for liftoff from the moon and rendezvous with Yankee Clipper. Looking good, Pete. Three, two, one, liftoff. And away we go. Where did it fire? Joy? We're on our way. And in one minute, go right 20 feet. Okay. Everything looks good, Pete. Sure it does. So they rose to their rendezvous, and from Dick Gordon and Yankee Clipper. Well, you sure look strange down there amongst all the sand dunes. All right. At a half a mile, uh, 19 feet a second. We're looking better all the time, Yankee. Okay, I'm down to three feet a second. Intrepid now, station keeping uh, with the Yankee Clipper. The two vehicles move together for docking. Conrad and Bean rejoined Dick Gordon in the command module, bringing with them the samples, experiments, and photographs to be returned to Earth. The next step, jettison the lunar module, then send it crashing into the moon to help calibrate the seismometer left on the surface. 
This instrument was designed to measure the intensity of meteor impacts, moonquakes, landslides, and similar phenomena. Guidance and control officer reports uh, that uh, the two spacecraft have uh, separated. Apollo 12, Houston, the LIM is on its way down. Right here, I want to the men on Earth monitored the output of the seismometer, waiting for impact. Countdown for limb impact. Three, two, one, mark. Limb impact. As for the meaning of it, I'd rather not make a, an interpretation right now, but uh, it is as though one had struck a bell, say, in the, in the bell, belfry of the church, a single blow, and found that the reverberation from it continued for 30 minutes. After 55 minutes, the reverberation still had not faded completely. Apollo 12 continued its orbits of the moon, gathering photography for scientific study, including the Fra Mauro area, the landing site for Apollo 13. And then it was time to head back to Earth. Roger, roger, bye-bye, see you on the other side. Have fun. The burn to send them home would take place behind the moon. On Earth, we waited. Waited for Apollo 12 once more. Apollo 12, Houston. Hello, Houston. Apollo 12, the crew home. Shortly before re-entry, the crew of Apollo 12 watched the Earth move to blot out the sun. We're getting a spectacular view at Eclipse. We're using the... Uh, then Apollo 12 hit the atmosphere of Earth at 25,000 miles an hour. Okay, it's right on the money. Right, we concur, Pete. The log of Apollo 12 does not end with splashdown. It only begins. Man, have I got the grapefruit rock of all grapefruit rocks. Hey, I, I'm looking at a rock that has all crystals in it. And on the moon, an experimental station called ALSEP sends back its data each experiment representing a milestone in our knowledge of the moon. The lunar ionosphere alias side uh, has been turned on and uh, I'm very happy to say is functioning perfectly. The solar wind spectrometer has been functioning, of course, since the also has been turned on. The seismic experiment, is, as has been reported, is functioning in all respects properly. Yeah, I think it will represent a major discovery of completely unanticipated about the moon. We're going to have to, to throw the book away and uh, begin over again, which seems to be the case for the moon in general. Apollo 12 was a milestone in manned extraterrestrial exploration. It achieved its pinpoint landing as close as possible to its selected target marked by surveyor. It set a pace and a pattern of scientific exploration that future missions will not only follow, but we'll go beyond. About a year later, six months after the uh, mission, we were going to show, run another film which is made a, a bit later, it's got better graphics and better um, imagery, but uh, we we're concerned about uh, copyright on the live stream. But what we think we'll do is we'll run it in the background during the break. But I've got a couple more slides here, just on a bit of extra... Oh, one thing that was brushed over in that particular film was the lightning strike. And I'm not sure whether people know of this guy, Scott Manley, but he's a bit of an egghead, but he's got this little film talking about, uh, you got it, so enjoy this.
Hello, it's Scott Manley here. If there were a greatest hits of Mission Control, then the words set SCE to aught would surely make the cut. A gutsy call by EECOM John Aaron, he basically showed the world what it was to be a steely-eyed missile man. This came during the launch of Apollo 12, crewed by Pete Conrad, Al Bean and Dick Gordon. It launched on November 14th towards the Ocean of Storms and kind of launched into a storm. I mean, it didn't actually launch into a thundercloud, but it was close enough to a thundercloud that the massive rocket and its exhaust trail acted like a lightning rod and... The vehicle was hit by lightning, not once, but twice. First it was hit at 36 seconds, and then 16 seconds later, 52 seconds, it took a second strike. The first strike had the primary effect of causing all three fuel cells to disconnect from the main power bus. Now, the solid state sensors would uh, you know, disconnect these to protect them. And what they saw was that the voltage was rising really rapidly, and I think the threshold was 500 volts per millisecond. So while it never reached like 200 volts, it rose fast enough that these three solid state sensors dropped the fuel cells off the bus, and that left batteries powering everything. Now the command module came with three batteries, A, B, and C, but only battery A and B are connected during launch. Battery C is kept disconnected intentionally because they would need that for to have in reserve for re-entry and landing. The switch over from the fuel cells to the battery was a rough affair. Voltage on the DC bus dropped from the designed 28 volts all the way down to 18 volts before it recovered to 24. But this large drop caused a number of electrical devices to basically stop working, you know, put themselves into safe mode, and it caused warning lights of all sorts. In fact, you can hear them reading off the warning lights. I got three fuel cell lights, an AC bus light, a fuel cell disconnect, AC bus overload, one and two, main bus A and B out. The second strike apparently managed to set a number of data lines going into the computer into a state where the computer thought that it needed to realign the inertial guidance platform really quickly. And so what happened was the inertial guidance platform, or rather the artificial horizon that they saw, just started spinning out of control. So the crew were starting to get worried. They saw the thing was spinning and they thought maybe the capsule was, was tumbling off the rocket or something, but then they realized that actually everything felt just fine. I mean, just fine for sitting on top of a 3,000 ton rocket. And indeed, through all of this, the rocket kept flying because all of this drama was really happening in the command module hardware, while the hardware that was controlling the rocket was in the rocket itself. It was the launch vehicle digital computer in the third stage of the Saturn V. This is a completely different computer built by IBM that was unrelated to the Apollo guidance computer in the command module. So while the rocket was still flying a solid course, Mission Control was trying to debug the problem and they couldn't really do much because the telemetry they were getting back from the spacecraft was complete garbage. The numbers were all over the place, it didn't make any sense to them. So, with obvious power problems happening and communications issues, the call went out from the flight director saying, Hey Tom, what do you say? So EECOM is the Electrical, Environmental and Consumables Manager, and that seat was John Aaron, who wasn't getting any more useful telemetry information than anyone else, but the garbled data reminded him of a situation he'd seen before. It stirred somewhere in his memory, and the suggestion that he came forth with was try setting SCE to AUX. Now SCE to AUX, that's a switch that sits at the bottom of the right hand panel, electrical panel, it has three states. It has normal, off and auxiliary. SCE stands for signal conditioning equipment and this was a box of electronics which was responsible for reading data from a multitude of sensors all over the spacecraft and sometimes polling those sensors. It would then take all this and convert all those voltages which could be all over the place into zero to five volt ranges so that they could then process and packaged up into nice telemetry packets that could be read by ground control. It was critically important and so it had 
redundant power supplies. The power supplies would take the 28 volt DC uh, power and it would generate 20 volt, 10 volt and 5 volt sources for its electronics. Now the system had sensors that would automatically switch power supplies if one failed. However, in this case, the power bus voltage had dropped and that would affect both power supplies. So switching supplies automatically wouldn't make any difference. The initial voltage drop was quite severe, I mean, down to like 18, 19 volts, and then it recovered to 24 volts, but the hardware had essentially decided to switch itself off. The, the critical value for this was apparently 22.9 volts, but it didn't get up high enough to restart itself automatically because of the undervolt condition on the, the DC bus. So without this working, the spacecraft would be unable to send sensible telemetry back to the ground. And without the telemetry, mission control was going to have a really hard time debugging this problem. And this is where, despite my research, things get a little bit unclear because as the story goes, flipping the switch to fix the problem. So I can only imagine that intentionally asking it to switch to the auxiliary power supply got rid of that extra test that checked for the undervolt condition and it began working at 24 volts which was 4 volts below what it was supposed to work. It took John Aaron a minute or so to come up with this recommendation and if you if you listen to the recordings it's clear that this is not something that featured heavily in the training. Between flight, Capcom and the crew they're not sure if it's FCE or SCE or NCE but Alan Bean eventually figured out where the switch was and the telemetry was restored. It only returned about 100 seconds into the flight. So for most of the first stage, the first two minutes of flight, the crew were basically facing a panel with more warning lights than they had seen in any simulation. But in the post-flight briefing, they were very clear that they were doing their best to diagnose the problem and they weren't about to randomly start switching switches to try and fix the problem because they would probably have made it worse. So with the telemetry restored, Mission Control knew that they had to bring the fuel cells back onto the power bus and they radioed that up to the crew. The crew decided to wait until after stage two had uh, separated and ignited. So about two minutes, 22 seconds back in, into the mission, they reconnected the fuel cells. And with the immediate danger dealt with, the crew were heard to speculate that maybe they had been hit by lightning. And they laughed their way into orbit. They said, oh, well, maybe we need some all-weather training. It's really fascinating to listen to this because clearly they were in this moment of extreme drama where they thought the whole mission might go awry, might fail. And after that was dealt with, you can hear that they are so much happier and they are cracking jokes. Hey, that's one of the better sims, believe me. They're alive. I'll tell you what happened. But of course, once they make it to orbit, mission control were very concerned about long-lasting effects of this, and they added a whole bunch of extra tests in the orbit while they were preparing for translunar injection. Uh, for example, they dumped like the Apollo guidance computer memory to make sure that it was all you know, sensible. Since they'd lost the orientation on the inertial guidance platform, they had to realign that multiple times because of course you'd perform an alignment and then you wait a bit and then you do another alignment and that is your drift and then you do another alignment, just checks. And this actually was really hard for them because they were in low earth orbit. They had a bright planet there and they were trying to look at stars. So dark adaptation was a real problem for them to find good stars. But yeah, they got that all aligned and then of course they put the SCE switch back into the normal position because you know, that was the position it was supposed to be in. And from there, yeah, the rest of the mission proceeded pretty much without any trouble. Well, without any other troubles that were related to this. I mean, it's often stated that the spacecraft escaped this uninjured, but truthfully, there were things that were broken. There were five temperature sensors over the, uh, five in the four on the surface and one on a, an instrument. Those were broken. There were, uh, pressure sensors in the reaction control thruster uh, fuel tanks, those were gone. Now, that complicated things, but they had other mechanisms to get the data that these uh, sensors would supply. 
and the Saturn V's launch vehicle guidance, the digital computer, it also showed some transient effects. While it was delivering telemetry via separate channels, it also showed dropouts and you know bizarre numbers. And also the X, one of the accelerometers, they had two accelerometers and they found that those had got way out of sync. They'd got out of sync by like nine pulses. Um, and they were only supposed to be out of sync by two. So the guidance computer then tries to fix the problem. And what it does is it picks the value which is closest to what it had predicted and then reset the other one. So the LVDC worked as uh, advertised. And so now I want to come back to John Aaron, who knew about that magic SCE to AUX switch. It's often misreported that he remembered this from a simulation, but that's not the case because the simulators that they trained on could never have replicated this situation, apparently. But he was on the shift in mission control when there was another team doing some tests on a, 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 a command module capsule, right? And he himself, in his oral history interview, describes this particular group as not all that. They weren't the A-team. <laughs> they'd gotten themselves into a situation where they'd managed to drop all the power from the command module and they were running on batteries. And he saw these strange numbers coming back. And what he found curious was that they hadn't dropped to zero that they had, they were just squirrely, were his exact words. And after, you know, they fixed the, the problem, got it running again, those numbers stuck with him and he went back to his office and he, he got together with an engineer from North American Aviation and they tried to figure out where these weird numbers were coming from and they traced it to the signal conditioning equipment and the magic SCE switch. So he was the one that knew this. And he may have been the only EECOM to know this, but it's often said that without him, the mission probably would have aborted. And I'm not, I'm not sure on that because it's very clear that the crew were working the problem. They understood that the fuel cells were actually not plugged in. There was some discussion about this. And sure, they would have had to have debugged this while launching, with mission control not having proper telemetry, but I think it wouldn't have been such a stretch for them to notice that they needed to bring the fuel cells back onto the bus. And once that happened, they would have got their telemetry back and everything else would have proceeded as normal. And finally, 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 there's one story that I've heard, which I don't know how true it is, but in that first orbit when they were testing everything out to make sure that they were able to go to the moon, there were a number of things that they couldn't test because they didn't have procedures. Some of them were not critical. Some of them could literally kill the crew. One of the ones that could kill the crew if it didn't work were the pyrotechnics on the parachutes. There was no way to test these in space. And so they looked at this problem and they said, well, if the parachutes don't work, they will die when they land. So why don't we send them around the moon first? Because if we come home and they fail, at least, <laughs> at least they'll have gone to the moon and they'll have had a grand adventure before plummeting to their death out without a parachute. I'm not sure how true that is, but it certainly is a sobering thought about the kind of decisions that the people in mission control had to make. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. So that's, is this on? So that's, uh, that's Scott Manley, and um, he's fantastic. Uh, he's uh, got a, a YouTube channel, which I strongly urge you to subscribe to. I think he's got, it says somewhere, he's got 984,000 subscribers. So we've tried to reach out to him, but it's only from a business connection. So I think the way YouTube works and whatever, if you have a number of subscribers, you get income from it anyway. So we've sort of tried, concerned about being copyright breaching. He doesn't say anything about copyright on here, so I think, to be honest, he's quite happy to get it out there, quite happy to get more people to watch his stuff. If you go there, you'll get lost for a day. He's got some fascinating stuff, historical stuff, new stuff, and he's just... He's, he's right on things. Like when they had that... Um, that uh, Starliner parachute thing, he had a video out within a couple of hours about what it possibly could have been. So uh, go and have a look at Scott Manley's YouTube channel. 
Oh, I've just got a couple more things to finish off on Apollo 12, and I think John wants to say a couple of quick words. So uh, there's a few nice pictures here, and uh, I thought I'd pull a couple out for you because there's a bit of a story behind them. Um, this is uh, Albine, and this is Pete Conrad photographing Albine. They basically both took a picture of each other staying in the same spot. Now what I want you to look at closely is down on Pete's left wrist. You probably all heard this. They have these cuff, cuff checklists. Well, Playboy on the Moon. That's Pete's cuff checklist with a Playboy bunny. Don't worry, it's been pixelated so we won't offend anyone in the room, hopefully. Uh, so five of them went, to the, went on Apollo 12. Uh, there were two checklists uh, for each of them and they all had uh, various uh, additions. So apparently it was Pete Scott, uh, so Dave Scott that uh, he was the backup commander and he secretly had them done. Bit of a project because, you know, these were printed on fireproof paper, they had to go through the whole thing, so in order to be able to get it done was a pretty, pretty good bit of work, I reckon. Um, they only noticed them when they got to the moon. And uh, also, Dick Gordon wasn't left out. He had a calendar in uh, one of the stowage lockers up there with uh, Dee Dee Lind, who's apparently now 73 years old. So anyway, you can look her up. Um, and they had this Ernie Rains, the chief of uh, pre-flight operations, did some cartoons in there. We, if you want to go off and have a look at that, you can uh, you can dig into that. Andrew's got a couple of stories on this as well, I believe. And this is something that just popped up the other day. Um, as you probably know, um, they had a combination of black and white and colour film. One of the colour film roles, they had a jam and they left it on the moon accidentally, but they left it on the moon. So someone's gone off and done this, colourised some of these uh, um, pictures for NASA. So I thought it was quite nice. So uh, sadly the crew of Apollo 12 are no longer with us. And I love this picture of Pete Conrad. Uh, so he died back in 1999, I think it was a motorbike accident. Is that just a classic photo? Pete with a cigarette hanging his mouth on a motorbike with a babe behind? Love it. Uh, then we lost uh, Dick Gordon in uh, 2017. And then finally, uh, more recently, we lost uh, Alan Laverne Bean. I didn't know his middle name was Laverne. I bet you kept that quiet amongst the fighter jock uh, group uh, in 2018. So. Sadly, they are no longer with us. John, you want to have a quick, quick word? <coughs> we don't have too much time. Uh, just a couple of things that uh, come back to me as I see these things after, uh, after 50, 50 years. Uh, uh, first of all, I'll just, just say how uh, great those um, uh, clips of, of Bruce Manley are, wonderful things like that. Uh, all very well to re-evaluate them uh, uh, in hindsight, um, but one of the things about uh, how that uh, ecom uh, engineer was able to figure out things because they have rehearsed, practised and understood those systems they, they just lived and breathed them, every one of those um, uh, senior engineers on, on the front desk. And they, uh, we, we had to do so many simulations of what goes wrong, what could go wrong, um, and literally stage by stage, two and three uh, levels down. Uh, if this, this remedy doesn't work in the first instance, uh, what's the alternatives then? And which is the better of those two, two choices? Um, that, that happened just time and time again because we did so many um, uh, catfish sims. Um, as regards the, the, uh, the main uh, film, uh, it just brings again to, to mind that after each of the missions, right, right through from uh, Germany, within about three to four weeks after each of the missions, we had uh, at the tracking stations a substantial film uh, like that that was sent to uh, to staff just to keep them um, up to date with how things have gone over uh, all together and as pro uh, not a, not so much a promotion, uh, a promotion but a um, uh, uh, stimulus to to uh, staff that things were but they were they were absolutely first-class product, film productions, um, 
all in beautiful rich colour, well well cut and, and edited. They ran uh, usually about three quarters of an hour, as I I recall, to cover uh, each of the missions uh, was good. Uh, and another recollection uh, was of the all-sep package that uh, that they left on the uh, on the surface. They'd uh, they'd left a, uh, one initially on Apollo 11, the first landing, uh, and it was I think there was five uh, discrete uh, packages uh, there. That was uh, bread and butter for the um, tracking stations around the world. The all uh, 12 or 13 of the of the uh, remote stations uh, around the world. It was a um, relatively low uh, data stream. I think it, was, it might have only been about eight kilobytes a second, uh, surprisingly, but that was pretty good in, in those days. Uh, and uh, uh, they, they uh, multiplex the, uh, the different um, uh, projects from the seismology of the solar wind, um, uh, I can't recall the other, the other ones here, but uh, we uh, all, all the tracking stations were then um, uh, assigned to cover um, 10 to 12 hours uh, a day uh, continuously just to monitor this um, uh, this slow rate uh, stream and that was fed real time uh, back to back to the various experimenters uh, there um, that's that's about all of those just just things that come to mind 50 years on thank you Thanks, so, John. I would let you lo talk longer, but we're pretty pressed for time tonight. John is uh, one of our historic uh, trackers from the Australian Tracking Network, so uh, catch up with John in the break. He's uh, got a lot of stories, and uh, as people may or may not know, NASA had a bunch of tracking stations and facilities in Australia. Unlike the rest of the world, it was staffed by Australians, so uh, that was one of the conditions that uh, was put on us hosting their equipment, uh, their facilities, so good on Australia. All right, so uh, we're going to move to some other quick news, just a quick Space Agency Watch as we do each month. Um, just a couple of things that the agency is doing. I'm not going to spend much time on this. We're running very low on time. Um, so they were at the uh, the International Astronautical Congress in Washington, so they signed up some cooperative agreements with the German Space Agency, Italian and New Zealand Space Agencies, and also... Uh, uh, a statement of intent and cooperation with Maxstar Technologies. And Minister Andrews and representative of the Australian uh, government uh, were there uh, with a discussion with NASA and they couple went off to the Kennedy Space Center as well. Good on them. Uh, there was also um, Australian Space Agency with CSIRO uh, sponsored a first ever group on Earth Observations Week. So that was uh, in November in Canberra. Oh, just last week. Week four. Um, I'm going to whiz through this because we don't have a lot of time. This is all available at the Australian Space Agency website, which is um, which is online there. I'll just whiz through that. All right. Um, now, this is another fascinating little segment. This guy is not James Bond. He's um, Professor Brian O'Brien. He's an Australian, um, and he's got a big involvement in Apollo. So I'll just quickly take you through these. Uh, Brian graduated at the School of Physics in Sydney, 54, and and then uh, got a PhD at 57 in Sydney. And he was a chief uh, deputy chief physicist at the Australian National Arctic Research Ex Expeditions in Melbourne, and then assistant to assistant then associate professor of physics, State University in Iowa. And he was really inspired by Van Allen and his team, and uh, he went to work with him. And he built this Engine 1, Engine 2, which ex rocket ex rock exploded, and Engine 3, um, and went on first involvement in Explorer 12, then 14, and earlier with uh, Explorer 7. Engine 1 was the first satellite to use digital telemetry, which was quickly adopted uh, local, uh, globally. And this is Engine 3. Looks very Soviet like, doesn't it? Um, he was then the visiting professor of physics at the Sydney University in 64, but then in 63 to 68 he was a professor of space science at Rice University in Texas. That's where JFK did his famous, we choose to go to the moon. Um, he even lectured the 1964 group of astronauts in Houston, and, and they built, launched and analysed uh, nine auroral rockets at Fort 
Churchill and the Aura 1 satellite from Vandenberg in 1967. Now this is uh, the invented this charged particle lunar environment experiment um, and it was selected by NASA to be on the first of seven, exper seven experiments for, Apollo, for LSAP. Sorry about my heavy breathing. There we go. And he also invented this dust detector experiment, um, which plays a significant role in his research. Then 71 to 77, he was uh, in the Environmental Protection Agency, founding director. And I got my formatting out the wrong way, but anyway, um, he's also got his own consultancy and he's, and he's uh, up to date uh, adjunct professor of physics at Western University of Western Australia. So I've got, I did an interview with uh, Brian uh, last year actually, um, but uh, we only managed to get uh, it fit into the schedule. So this goes for about 20 minutes. And this is Brian speaking last, I think it was November, in Perth, at his home in Perth. In 1957, and because my wife to be was in Melbourne, I went to the end to Melbourne. I went to the Antarctic. I'd often always wanted to go to the Antarctic, and down there I saw the exquisite auroras, which I strongly recommend any of you, you listeners and viewers see a big strong aurora. In it. Your life, your mind won't be the same again. It's absolute magic. And I decided this was 1958, which was the year of the first American satellite. So I decided uh, I'd try and get a job with Van Allen, who, who built the first American satellite. And he kindly he offered me a job in Iowa. And that's when I. Um, wandered around as an assistant professor of physics and I was teaching as well but doing research with a couple of NASA satellites and learning the ropes in the midst of all these undergraduates who were using all these complicated words about satellites that I didn't understand at all. Anyhow I finally got an offer for uh, building a satellite Engine 1, we hitchhiked on a couple of classified payloads. Uh, they said, you have five months, four months, five months. To build it, it could be no bigger than 13 inches high and weigh 40 pounds, less than 40 pounds. Otherwise, we'll just build a substitute block of wood if you're not on schedule. So from then, we built my dream satellite. And that's engine one, 40 pounds, less one ounce, 13 inches high. And that uh, was launched on 29th of June, 1961. And because we built it completely in-house and whatever, and I'm a great believer in total systems, everything coming together, like the spaceship Earth and satellite. All the bits work, but all the bits should work together. And so I decided uh, to find out if instead of the sing-song telemetry, I could use digital telemetry. So Engine 1, incidentally, was the first satellite ever to use digital telemetry, which of course just swept the world. But it made all sorts of discoveries and wonderful stuff. Uh, so then there was an engine two and the rocket blew up as they used to those days. And engine three, I just had discovered a few things. and So I was able to double the weight of engine three on the grounds of discoveries about uh, a big bomb, big de thermonuclear device that the Americans had exploded. Do you like that? Uh, in the early 90s, uh, there were relations between the Soviet Union and, and the United States were not, the, not a happy one. And this was, you'll recollect, about the time of the Cold War and the race to 
for Apollo and so on. The early 60s, you mean? Early 60s? Yeah, I think you said the early 90s. Oh, sorry. Early 60s. So both countries were, both unions were setting off uh, explos thermonuclear explosions in the upper atmosphere. And the biggest and most notable was Starfish, 1.4 megaton, exploded 400 kilometres above Johnson Island in the Pacific. And that was about 70 times bigger than Hiroshima or Nagasaki. Big bomb. Did lots of things. One of the things it did was, uh, first of all, it's the, actually, basically it's the device that, made the Pentagon more alert to an electromagnetic pulse. So then they studied that and did research, classified research. And ultimately that gave rise to the internet. That's one of the reasons it was important. But it also gave rise to a lot of high energy trapped radiation, which then bombarded the solar cells and caused them to fail on eight satellites and the only satellite that kept working was my little engine one for various reasons uh, so that was the only one that made the before and after measurements of this great new uh, radiation hazard uh, so i played various other games with with satellites in 65, oh sorry, so I worked in Iowa until 1963, then in 63 got appointed to be Professor of Experimental Space Science at Rice University in Houston. Uh, I won't go into all the details, but uh, they kindly built a laboratory for me and a few things like that. And uh, we had a ball. We built nine rockets, small ones and big ones, big tomahawks like the, the crews, the uh, military satellites, basically tomahawks. Uh, ones that uh, we launched them at Cape, at um, Church of Fort Churchill in the, the bottom of Hudson's Bay in the Pole, North Pole. And they'd go up to seven, eight hundred kilometres, so they'd attract the interest of the Russians looking across it. I mean, various things. Made all sorts of discoveries. Uh, and then in Iowa also, in Rice, in Houston, I was also able to get funding from the Navy to build another independent satellite, uh, Aurora 1. But then NASA came along with this invitation for people to make proposals for experiments to go to be part of self-supported uh, geophysical observatories that the astronauts would, would deploy on the moon. So that sounded like fun and I, I, I thought I could probably uh, usefully measure auroral radiation in the long magnetospheric tail that would flap against the moon in times of full moon. I can show you a photograph of that. Uh, so that was my charged particle radiation experiment, seeply. And I've got a, a um, photo of that. That's about a, uh, a real size, yeah, it's about the real size of it. But on the 11th and 12th of January 1966, I will remember that seven principal investigators uh, of these experiments, chosen out of 90 proposals, uh, the seven principal investigators met with the two aerospace companies who were going to build the, the bus, if you like, the Apollo Lunar Surface Experiment Package that would hold two or three of these, each Apollo mission. And NASA and the aerospace people said, uh, I'd have to put a dust cover over the, 
the apertures where the particles went in here to stop dust being blown up when the astronauts left. The rocket exhaust would stir the dust up and so on. And so for January the 11th and the 12th, we had small discussions, uh, feverish at time, uh, because I didn't mind doing that. And in fact, I thought it was sensible. But I also thought what would be sensible would be to measure a dust detector in the LCEP each time to find out if the hypothetical dust really existed. I thought that was just bloody common sense. NASA didn't think so, and whatever. So I got, I left Los Angeles, fly back home to Houston, fairly, fairly cranky about the fact that they wouldn't fly a dust detector. And the major reason they said was that, the, first of all, there wasn't one that wasn't above more than two kilograms, and they couldn't afford two kilograms. But most of all, they couldn't afford to fly one, particularly on Apollo 11, which is a critical one, because they couldn't spare the extra minute or two to, that Buzz Aldrin would have to spend deploying it. And it wasn't the cost, a million dollars per minute type cost. It was his time, very, very valuable time. And that is a valid point. So on the way back, I had a double scotch, I must admit, <laughs> before dinner, uh, feeling cranky, and had a bit of a doze, and somehow or other, my uh, frontal lobe invented a dust detector that would be very lightweight, turned out to be a quarter of a kilogram, but most important, that he wouldn't have to uh, deploy. I just bolt the damn thing on the nearest thing I could find that could be pointed. And that's what happened. And so, uh, little dust detector, rather like this, is about the real size, uh, is now deployed on the moon by Apollo 11, 12, 14, and 15. And Apollo 13 had one of these, and the charged particle experiment and they're of course at the bottom of the ocean now so that's but that's fun because I'm the only bloke that has got two Apollo experiments in different disciplines and it doesn't mean a thing but it, it's nice nice to say I guess okay so, so I'm saying it today not too many people make the point so then I was thoroughly into the business of dust on the moon. And it turned out that NASA didn't want to know about it. Uh, in fact, the official policy was to dismiss the importance of dust. So they didn't want to measure it, uh, but I got a bit cranky and uh, they agreed to find it on float flight on Apollo 11. They didn't like my invention, uh, so they modified it, because they claimed that the dust was unimportant, and they were wrong in that as well, using wrong data, wrong survey data. So it was a struggle all the way, it's been a struggle ever since actually. Uh, so I got the four up there, and then they, on Apollo 11, the dust then was so thick that it caused the experiment that Buzz had deployed to overheat. So NASA's first report, that this uh, much worn Apollo 11 preliminary science report, they included a report from the dust detector which said there was no significant effect. So I had one hell of a fight with them because there, there was a significant effect. So that that report also has got my name attached as one of the co-authors without my permission. So that didn't make me very happy. 
So, uh, anyhow, that's life. If you refer to my website, www.brianjobrian, with an A and then an E, dot com, you'll see the original stories here, so that what I'm telling you is documented in there, signed by Jim Bates, and the other one signed by Jim Bates, and um, uh, the scientist involved. So you can, anything I'm saying now, you'll find in, in the website, the original, often unpublished stuff, the archival stuff. Uh, so let me go back. So uh, I persuaded them to, the two original authors, co-authors of that, the original authors, to agree with me that there was a significant effect on Apollo 11. And so we published that with me as lead author. We did that in 1970. They then asked me to write the report for Apollo 12. So I did that, but they wanted it very quickly, and I didn't have any of the second lunar day data, so I only had a very superficial thing. So I submitted it as they'd asked, and they never published it. And now we're getting down into the deep and dark stuff. I then tried to publish it independently with one of the scientific journals. And I knew the, the editor very, fairly well and talked to him in Washington. And he gave me a very rational reason which had nothing to do with science, why he couldn't publish it. it at that time, you might remember, this is for those of you who can remember back to 69, there was a very fierce group powerful lobby group throughout the USA declaring that the whole Apollo thing was a fake. Now the editor of this journal, and as I say, I knew well, he knew me well, he published various papers of mine. He said, Brian, I cannot afford to publish your Apollo 12 paper because there's no proof that it's on the moon. And I said, I can show you photographs. He said, they don't care about photographs. I really need NASA to admit that it's there. And I said, well, NASA declined to publish my report. And he said, well, I'm stuck. And I said, I'm stuck. And that, that's the story of... So I never could publish that until years later I came across to to back to Australia in 68. We had personal reasons to come across. 68 was a very cruel year in America. The assassination of Martin Luther King. Bobby Kennedy got assassinated in Los Angeles airport on the same night that we were flying out. But we had personal problems with the... We used to go in the car for a surf down at Galveston Beach, for example, only an hour away. And I used to normally load the car up with the smallest bub in the middle seat, or in a baby seat between the two, two adult seats and so on, and pack around her as one does. This Sunday, for some reason, I didn't do that. And I go out, and there's a bullet hole through the front window. So we didn't, didn't go to Galveston. And we had other instances, there was a break-in with, I was on travel a lot, so we came back to Australia. And I became the first director and chairman of the Environmental Protection Authority in Western Australia. And had my hands full that I certainly couldn't do any more with doing anything about the analysis of the, the dust tapes, which... My wife very kindly brought across the Nullarbor, about 150, 170 of these. And just from the fun point of view, this is two and a half kilograms per tape for about three days' data. And those of you who are interested in data, this is 800 bits per inch. So you've got in there not a great deal of data, 
This is for the dust particle alone. Dust data alone. I realised I haven't uh, described the, the dust detector. What it is, is just three solar cells, one pointing east, one pointing west, one pointing up. So pointing east to measure sunrise, so I thought it's sunrise. The, the belt of, of the blast of sunlight in space with the x-rays, all the energetic particles, would belt the heck out of the dust particles. Uh, cause photoelectric effects, knocking the electrons out of the, each atom and charging it up positively. And then the positively charged particles would repel each other and repel from the Earth and start dancing around. And indeed the little dust, dust detector measured that. And then there's another cell on top to measure any accumulated dust. Uh, very simple, total cost 100, 200 bucks at most, uh, digital and um, whatever, so it's one of my favourite inventions, uh, which keeps on giving actually, you know, all sorts of ways. Just in the timing, you mentioned you came back to Australia in 68? Yep. The, the experiments obviously flew in 69 and later on, so you were... You were they, they used to commute across. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. And um, I didn't go across for a living because I knew it would be a madhouse. But I went across and was in mission control for 12 and for 13, 14. I didn't go across for 15. Did you attend any launches? Oh, yeah. We'd go down to the launch first and then oh, come wow. back to Houston. Uh, and well, I've been to a lot of launches, but not as impressive as Saturn V, I will admit. Mm. That machine gun uh, noise is staggering. <laughs> Apollo 13 was an interesting one because uh, I'd rented an apartment over there, or the folk at a point rented one for me to do analysis of data on the assumption <laughs> It went to the moon. And of course with the problems with that, the astronauts were lost in space. And it so happens in my younger days, when I was 19, I was a mad keen cave explorer. And I got lost for three days, 79 hours actually, by myself in the dark at the East Deep Creek Cave in Yerringabilly and without anybody else and I was properly lost because I didn't know if my mate had got out. And there are two ways to get lost. You can get lost but know that somebody knows you're lost and you can get really lost if you don't know that anybody's likely to be looking for you or even knows where you are. I was really lost and so of course the similarity with the Apollo 13 being lost in space really got to me for those three, three nights. But I couldn't talk, talk to anybody about it. But as I walked back from the air conditioned manned spacecraft centre, uh, back in Mission Control Centre, in fact, back to my apartment, the moon was up there, sort of looming large. And I had this knowledge that the three boys were up there freezing cold as, as I was as well, or colder than I'd been. And that was interesting. Uh, yeah. There are lots of stories about all of the stuff. Uh, but again, go to the website, go to my website, and um, go from there and hopefully enjoy it. Can, can I just add one thing that Bazin, Jacques Bazin, says that science is a glorious entertainment. And it has been, I'm 84, 85 next month, 
uh, science has always been a glorious entertainment. And engine one was that in spades. But this little bugger, <laughs> it keeps on giving on. And this year, because the NASA website about this has got so many errors, I thought they should be corrected for the Apollo 50th anniversary, Apollo 11 50th anniversary. And let's just say that I'm on my way to having them corrected. The, the server came down for two and a half months and went up with some corrections, but not enough. So the glorious entertainment lives on. But, but, oh yeah, I reckon that deserves a clap. I think he's watching, is this on? He's watching from Perth, so Brian, thank you for that. Uh, we spoke for quite a long time, I could not fit everything in. Um, fascinating guy. I've got a couple of extra slides here that sort of helps to paint some of the picture of, of what Brian was talking about, and I hope I do it justice, Brian, if you're watching. So this is a little slide on, on kind of what, uh, what the Australian involvement in, in Apollo 11 was. Obviously you've got the dust detector, measuring the effects transmitted uh, to the ground stations, John being one of the people involved in that. Um, the tapes, which he had as well, and Brian's analysis and publications. So uh, this, uh, this shot here, if that's on, the dust detector is on the other side, you can't quite see it, but it, um, it's on the other side of that. That's Buzz there after you just deployed that, uh, that device there. So this is Brian with the charged particle lunar environment experiment, which is actually the unit was going to go on, well, it went on Apollo 13, but as he uh, mentioned, it's now in the ocean. Uh, this is the same unit on Apollo 14, which actually made it to the surface. Uh, that's it right there, sitting there near the ground station. And then here's his dust detector. And you can see it on the, the base station there, sitting up in the corner. As he said, it didn't require much in the way of weight or anything. It just plunked it on the corner there, and uh, so, so that's how it flew. So uh, a very successful experiment. And there's a bit of a close-up there, but you can see it right there. Pretty impressive, I think. So um, they deployed these dust detectors on 11, 12. One flew on 13, but as we heard, it, it uh, ended up in the ocean. 14 and 15. The uh, charged particle device uh, flew on Apollo 14 um, and is also on the ocean as well <laughs> for that Apollo 13. Uh, so 14 peer-reviewed discoveries about movements of dust on the moon, which you can see Brian is very passionate about that. Um, and it was the only really uh, such measurements of uh, the dust uh, that was actually conducted. And um, once again, Brian's got a couple of quotes here from Brian. The Apollo space suits and equipment designs left very little room for error, and all the astronauts experienced uh, issues with the dust. So you can see the quote there that um, his uh, dust experiment, about 100 bucks, uh, added a lot to um, to the understanding of what they're going to be dealing with, especially when they go back. So they were deployed by Buzz, Alan, Ed, and Jim on those missions, and they were switched off in '77. So obviously Brian's conscious of the plans going back to the moon and onto Mars and dust being a critical part of that's going to be a big consideration. Got an insect. Now this is an interesting uh, thing. Um, Brian believes that the uh, U-2 lunar rover in, it failed in January uh, was caused by the lunar dust. And actually when I'd spoken, when I met with Brian last year, he, uh, he wasn't really able to talk about it, but he was actually in discussions with the Chinese Space Agency about their ongoing lunar uh, experiments and uh, devices, so watch his space. There's a nice quote here from Gene Cernan. We can overcome physiological and physical or mechanical problems except dust. The dust adheres to everything, no matter what kind of material, it, with the restriction, friction-like action. You can see all the dust here. This is after one of the EVAs. Look at them. Any space on the gear, etc. So. And this is Brian meeting uh, Jean back in 2006. So obviously Jean is no longer with us, but uh, it was lovely that they got together. And as I mentioned earlier on the presentation, Brian was actually one of the tutors for the, uh, the class of astronauts 
back in uh, 64, I think it was. So that was lovely, full circle there. Uh, obviously, sadly, Jean is no longer with us. All right, so that's the end of that for now. We're going to take a little break. How much have we got now? 15? 15 minute break. Uh, please feel free to say hello to somebody you haven't spoken to before. Take a break. Shouldn't switch the microphone off. We'll see you soon, and we've got uh, planetary and science news after the break. Thanks. The home box office television miniseries from the Earth to the Moon. Uh, they mixed up the Playboy pictures and they put colour ones in instead. So in the move, in the film, if you watch at the appropriate place, and I do have the clip, but I'm not going to show it tonight. They, they they've got the the wrong astronaut with the wrong picture, and uh, they put colours on the checklist, which in fact they were black and white as you have just seen them. Now, I met Pete Conrad. Uh, when he came to New Zealand to sell Air New Zealand, or try to sell Air New Zealand DC-10s, he worked for McDonnell Douglas. And I had lunch with him, and he had a tie, not the same one I showed you before, and on the tie was this badge, a little badge. And it said, and I looked at it and I said, what does that mean, Pete? And I wonder if you can get what Y-D-N-G-T-D-B-S-O-Y-B means, and uh, some of you heard me tell the story before, you do not get things done by sitting on your bum. And that was given to him by the management of McDonnell Douglas on his first day at work as, a, as, a, as, a work, as their work ethic or work motto. So uh, that was uh, my little story of <coughs> Apollo 12. Now, Going on to the planetary report, somewhere in here I have got a PowerPoint presentation which I did on Planck. Okay. Now, I'm going to talk about an open or closed case. Question mark, and you'll get the point of the question mark later. Now, going back to the early 20th century, Edwin Hubble interpreted the systematic redshift of galactic spectral lines with increasing distance as Doppler shift. Hubble's own uh, measurements or observations were of only a few nearby galaxies. Uh, since then, data has been extended out to even the most distant galaxies, and the interpretation was that the universe is expanding. Now this is supposed to be an animated uh, GIF which uh, shows it expanding, but uh, the software doesn't play it, GIFs. Now, the relationship is linear. It's known as Hubble's Law. Uh, now, if we do not accept Fred Hoyle's hypothesis that matter is continuously created so that the universe has constant density, then we conclude that in the past it was much denser than at present, and in the future will be much less dense. Now, in the past, the universe must have been very dense and very hot. So, around about 380,000 years of age, the universe became transparent. Um, and it would have produced a lot of high energy electromagnetic radiation, and it's been traveling through the universe ever since. Now, the wavelength of a gamma ray is around about 10 to minus 12 meters, and the length of a microwave is about 10 to the minus 2 meters or a centimetre. Now, if space itself is expanding and the galaxies are being carried by this expansion, then the redshift in galactic light that Hubble observed is not caused by Doppler, as Hubble first thought, and as which you'll find many, many books today even claim it is. 
So galaxies are not moving through space. It is space itself which is expanding and stretching the electromagnetic wave as it travels through space. Now, in 1948, George Gamow calculates that uh, the redshift would be stretched, uh, would have stretched the primordial gamma radiation down to microwave. This, this corresponds to a temperature drop of more than 10,000, well, from more than 10,000 Kelvin down to 2.7 Kelvin, which is 2.7 degrees above absolute zero. Now, this radiation was finally found in 1964 by Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson. And um, I could sing the Telstar song at this point because that dish was used to track Telstar. Yeah. Now, it was named the Cosmic Microwave Background Radiation and the measured wavelength corresponded to the predicted 2.7 Kelvin. And that's the, uh, the, the actual data there. And uh, you notice it's even all over, except the white strip across the middle, which is, of course, due to our own galaxy. Now, Hubble uh, counted galaxies in all directions and distances. And he found that the universe is homogeneous, at large scales, that is. In other words, the galaxies are evenly spaced. The most recent surveys support this finding. You notice that in, the, in those uh, circles, it looks pretty much the same. He also found that the universe is isotropic. In other words, the universe looks the same in all directions whichever way you look. This means that there is no meaningful center to the universe. Radio astronomers measure the cosmic microwave background to be isotropic to better than 0.1%. In 1989, George Smoot's Cosmic Background Explorer was launched, satellite. The COBE measured temperatures to better than 70 micro Kelvin. By 1992, Smoot had enough data to release his findings. Taken overall, the cosmic micro background is isotropic, but there are hints that the early universe had inhomogeneities, and that means there are places that are hotter or colder. And uh, it was now thought that that led to today's galaxies and clusters of dark matter. So, back to the density issue. If the density of the universe is high enough, the present expansion will be halted by gravity. The universe will shrink. Such a universe would be closed. If the density is low, then the universe will expand forever the universe would be open. So the question was at this time, is the universe open or is it closed? Enter stage left, dark matter. Even counting dark matter, the universe's density is very close to the boundary between the open and closed situation. The COBE results were not good enough to resolve the issue. So here we see, I'll just give you a moment to read that. Okay. So in uh, the year 2000, Boomerang balloons were launched from Antarctica to high altitude and measured the cosmic microwave. And then, from 2003 to 2010, the Wilkinson microprobe, sorry, I'll start that again, the Wilkinson microwave anisotropy probe satellite collected data. The satellite's known as WMAP. 
And uh, the results were eagerly received. And the results were in favour of a flat universe. The universe would therefore expand forever. And this was the basis of that thing. However, the discovery of dark energy pretty much sealed the deal. In the early 2010s, this was our understanding of the composition of the universe. 4% of ordinary atoms, like this table, 22% dark matter, and this newly discovered dark energy, which comprises 74% of the mass energy of the universe. Uh, your, well, theorised to explain the observations uh, that were made at the time. I'm not, this is a, a brief, quick summary. It's not a detailed thing. Okay, let's go on then. In uh, 2010, sorry, sorry, in 2013, the European Space Agency launched the Planck satellite. From its unique vantage point, it was able to measure the cosmic back microwave background in nine frequency bands to an accuracy of five microkelvin. From Kobe to Planck, we have improved our view of the cosmic microwave background. Planck also made numerous other measurements. The most accessible measurements were the temperature picture, the one that gets put in the papers, because um, the graphs and so on are beyond, incomprehensible to most people, including me. Um, so here we see the improved angular resolution from half a degree to 0.7 degrees in anger, angle. And the temperature resolution went from 70 microkelvin to five microkelvin. Most of the Planck findings were very relevant to this talk, but they're too technical for us to discuss here in detail. It's one of them there. So let's go on to a before and after Planck. Before, we had little or no polarisation data about the cosmic microwave background. After Planck, we now have lots of polarisation data. Before Planck, there were three bands shown here. And after Planck, we now have nine bands of measurement of the cosmic microwave background. Before Planck, I've shown you this diagram before. After Planck, it turns out there's a bit more real matter, let's call it real matter, <laughs> um, about up to 4.9%, nearly 5%. Uh, dark matter's gone up to 26%, and uh, a little less dark energy uh, at about 68.5%. So there's an important finding from Planck. The expansion rate of the universe, remember that was one of the main reasons for putting up the Hubble Space Telescope. Well, before Planck, it was 73 kilometres per second per megaparsec. And at the, um, after Planck, it's down to 67.4, plus or minus 1%. Before Planck, yeah, we said the cosmological theory said, OK, dark matter and dark energy probably exist, but are they necessary for a, a fundamental theory of the universe? And the answer with Planck is yes. Dark matter and dark energy are not only real, but they are necessary to explain the um, universe. And so we have the lambda cold dark matter model of the universe, which I'm not going to fully explain. Before Planck, there were more than three types of neutrino uh, possible. After Planck, only three types. No more. There's not a fourth neutrino or fifth or whatever, only three. The mass of the neutrino is less than 0.04 electron volts per square, speed of light squared. In plain language, that means they're less than one ten millionth the mass of an electron, which is pretty light. And it turns out that neutrinos have 72 
percent of the kinetic energy of the cosmic microwave background photons as well. Before Planck, we weren't sure whether the dark energy changed with time. Does it get stronger or weaker? The answer is no, it doesn't change. And the cosmological constant, as it's called, is 1.03 plus or minus 0.03. And that means that's pretty much one. And that means there'll be no big crunch, so it won't come back collapsing down again, and no big rip. In other words, it won't rip space apart. It will expand, continue expanding, but not rip things apart. So, it turns out that the geometry of the universe, according to Planck, is that it's perfectly flat. We're indistinguishable from being perfectly flat. Before Planck, the age of the universe was estimated to be 13.7 billion years. Now it's 13.8 billion years. The observable universe, therefore, is 46.5, with W map measurements now, it's a bit smaller, 46.1 billion years. Something very technical, the tensor scale ratio, before Planck was 0.3, now it's 0.07, but probably zero according to the statistical rules. Before the Planck, the, the measured 0.3 uh, allowed many theories of inflation. Inflation is that rapid expansion right at the very beginning of the universe. Now, the result rules out many of those models. There's still a few left around, but most of the model, models that were around before are gone. Again, I said the graphs are rather technical, so this is the um, tensor to scalar ratio. And various models are, are plotted here, and various results done. And Planck comes in and shows it's one. So that means that the big rip uh, will not be happening. So we come to a paper published um, earlier this year on September the 24th, just about a month ago, no, two months ago now. And all those people put their names to it. Gone to the days when you know, people like Rutherford did a scattering experiment and there was only one name on the paper, Ernest Rutherford. Now it's a whole lot of people. Well, that was uh, based on the um, releases. Some of the papers were published in 2013 and 2016 or 17, and now this is the latest one, published just a few months ago. Well, it looked like then that it's all settled. Lambda, uh, sorry, uh, that's um, omega. Omega equals one, which means the universe is flat. Well, that's it. Case closed. The universe is open and it's flat. It's not closed. But then, these guys and and published this. Planck evidence for a closed universe and a possible crisis in cosmology. The recent Planck legacy of 2018 release has confirmed the presence of an enhanced lensing amplitude of the cosmic micro background power spectra compared to the projected in the standard model. And I won't read through the rest of that, but they're saying that uh, the curvature is closed to a 99% certainty, according to their analysis of the data. Oh dear, what the heck's going on? Well, others say uh, that this is just a statistical um, fluke. By the way, in a, closed, in, in, a, in a flat universe, two parallel lines will go on forever and never meet. Uh, you can see what positive and negative curvature does. And that means that it, that curvature will, will bend the way in which the mi cosmic microwave background rays reach us and the other rays. So, the, um, 
the, the opposition to that paper said, oh, it's just a statistical fluke. Well, the Planck telescope measures the density of the universe by gauging how much of the cosmic microwave background light has been deflected while traveling through the universe. For example, gravitational lensing affects the path of the cosmic microwave background. It shows up as a blurring effect. So those lumps and things we see uh, could be real in the sense that the universe is closed. Well, let's go back to Planck. Planck says uh, the density of the universe is 5.7. And the dissident trio, as I'll now call them, say there are six atoms per cubic metre. Now, six is more than the critical density of 8.62 plus or minus 0.012 by 10 to minus 27 kilograms per cubic metre. Now, that's why I put it in number of atoms per cubic metre. <laughs> Okay, so six is enough to close the universe. 5.7 means the universe is flat. Okay. Planck needs six parameters to describe the universe. I won't go into those details. The dissonant trio say, uh oh, no, we need seven parameters. And they support their case with eight diagrams. There's number one, two and three, four and five and six, Seven and eight. As I said, they're rather technical and I won't explain them. So, the um, seventh parameter would be a number to describe the curvature of the universe. So you add an, another factor called the curvature. Well, the majority of cosmologists say that this is a statistical anomaly a few point out that it is from su such anomalies that new discoveries are made. So, what to think? Is this a statistical anomaly, as the majority of scientists say, or do we need new physics, as the dissident trio say? At that point, I'm going to hand over to Angelo. <laughs> and well, and you could, as, of as the hundred, of the hundred, there's probably about three answers to them. Hang on, hang on. A bit of democracy tonight. Ah. Uh, there's more to cover than we have time for. So, here's my question to all of you. What would you like to talk about? We've got uh, a big section on commercial crew, a little bit on SLS Orion Moon, and we've got a fair bit on SpaceX. So, you want it all? We won't have time. I'll tell you what I'll do is I'll start with commercial crew, and then we'll go to the big, the big bang, as I call it. My version of the Big Bang, <laughs> which is the uh, uh, spaceship Mark One. Anyway, let's go straight to uh, commercial crew. There is an ele electron launch, by the way, in the next few days. I just uh, saw Twitter tonight, and I think they're putting it on the 28th. I did have a little section. So the 28th is uh, it's number 10. Okay, let's move. Go back two slides. Why? Space policy. Um, right, the Senate, all right, space policy. The Senate really authorised. Sorry? Turn it into a slideshow. Yes, even better. Okay, here we go. So the Senate committee uh, recently approved a NASA authorisation. Uh, and the bill really provides to keep the station going on to 2030. 
So if you think um, going to the moon's going to drain some money, unfortunately the space station will as well. And the problem is, uh, in government, they will tick off everything and say, yeah, we want this and we want that, but they don't back it up with the money. So and that's been the history of NASA from, for a long time. Um, they've also actually renamed, uh, proposing to rename NASA's Plum Brook Station in Ohio after Neil Armstrong. So there'll be another place named after Neil. And interestingly, uh, the Orion capsule is now heading down there for its uh, shake tests and et cetera, et cetera, ready for the Artemis One mission. Uh, of course, there's doubts about the funding and uh, a recent House uh, Space Committee uh, questioned the agency's existing plans, which is really based on commercial, you know, partnerships. And these guys are turning around and saying, oh, you know, I don't think going commercial is really going to guarantee mission success. Uh, therefore, you know, even former astronaut Tom Stafford and a few others uh, in endorsed against contracting on a commercial basis. In other words, use the big, you know, government contracts. Now, as you know, the big government contracts, because of a bit of uh, bloat, bloated uh, bureaucracy and other factors, uh, will often cost four times what a commercial outfit could uh, do, do things for. And one could argue the virtues of that, but the reality is that money's going down, down the drain. Okay, let's talk about commercial crew. I had to put this in because it was important. Uh, during a recent report by NASA's own Inspector General, uh, they criticised additional payments made to Boeing on, uh, for the commercial crew project. And that's pretty amazing because they're criticising their own, their own employer, employer about how they selected SpaceX Boeing. Uh, the report cited the usual technical stuff, but the real key was the cost. And what it boiled down to was two key factors. To launch on a Boeing CST-100 will cost $90 million per flight. The Russians, by the way, are charging at the moment in the order of about 80, 80 million. Sorry, per, per seat. Yeah, this is per seat. And 55 million for Dragon. Actually, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if, because they all carry four astronauts. So I, I'd be curious about that number. But the reality is that Boeing received the lion's share of the, the, the money when it first started developing its CST-100, uh, $400 uh, million, million dollars, and SpaceX only received about 3.8. Uh, and yet, they're costing not almost twice the amount. So. It goes to, to say a lot. The other thing was, um, the committee came up and said that uh, Boeing basically got $300 million to continue in the program. Uh, in other words, it was a bit of, uh, I wouldn't say bribery, but uh, Boeing supposedly threatened to pull out. And because NASA wants uh, two uh, crew vehicles, they paid Boeing that money. And uh, so it was uh, really disappointing. And of course, Boeing... Um, rejected all this, of course, but not, not with a lot of detail, but uh, uh, there is clearly what the committee are saying is favouritism towards Boeing. And SpaceX kind of got shrugged off a little bit. But to his credit, Elon Musk has never said boo other than, I thank NASA. And so he ought to, because without them he, he wouldn't be where he is. Anyway, so that's, that was an interesting report. Um, of course, uh, there's other things, factors like the, uh, you find that the space station will be undermanned as a consequence of all these delays that are occurring now with the commercial crew program. And, and one fact that I found very surprising was the amount of research that they can actually do in a week uh, per person. Yeah. Uh, I've, where did I put it? Did I skip it? Yeah. 12 hours of research a week. That's what we're going to get in the next, uh, in the coming year, the 2020 year. And, um, however, that, even when it's fully complemented, uh, I should have had a number there, but I, I saw it. Uh, it's not a huge amount. It's just amazing just how much little research they do in that place. 
in the space station. It's really shocked me, to be honest. I suspect most of the time is to keeping the space station going and keeping themselves going, exercising and all the rest of it because of all these ill effects that we're now discovering about long-term uh, exposure. Yeah. Go on, sorry. Yes. Correct. So they currently perform 12 and it goes down to five and a half next year because of these delays, That's which is per astronaut. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, it still staggers me, but anyway, per week. Okay, moving on. which raises a question, are we getting bangs for bucks? And now we're talking, now we're talking moon bases. You know, is that going to suffer the same sort of uh, problem? Moving on. Uh, the report uh, which Michael showed me the other day has a lot of nice pictures and a lot of graphs and a lot of information. If you have time, have a read. They're the two proponents. These are the two groups of astronauts that will fly SpaceX on the right and the Starliner on the left. We'll talk about Boeing uh, on the 4th of November. They actually had a port ab abort test, and um, I'll go into that in a sec. But on the 17th of December, they're going to fly their, what they call, orbital flight test number one, uh, which is now gearing up, and I'll show you some pictures. Probably early 2020, you'll get the crew OFT, maybe even mid, uh, um, mid next year. Uh, and then the operational missions towards the end of next year. And this is what Na NASA is banking on to, to actually provide its crew rotations. Incidentally, one of the, both CST-100 and both SpaceX, you'll find, will probably only launch one to one and a half missions per year, which is quite staggering. I, when, we, when Michael and I was talk, were talking about it the other day, it surprised me, but that actually is the case because of all the traffic, the Sawyers, the progress and all the scheduling that has to be done, they'll only launch all this for one and a half missions per uh, commercial group per year. I, I don't I don't know that offhand, but uh, they're not quite as good as the Soyuz at this point, but I think they've got that capability. Okay, there it is. That's what we're going to see very shortly on the 17th. Uh, I, th I like this picture. This is what uh, uh, a launch aboard actually looks like. This goes back to the Apollo days. I just thought I'd throw that in because I like it. <laughs> but uh, pretty amazing. But that was a little Joe test of the Apollo days, and the actual booster failed and the uh, command, uh, sorry, the command module actually did what it was supposed to do, the launch abort system. Okay, this is the Boeing uh, CST-100 sitting on the pad a week ago and let's just watch it. We've got, we got sound. Well, good morning, everybody, oh, and welcome to our live coverage of Boeing's pad abort test. We are coming to you live from the desert out at the White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. I'm NASA's Dan Hewitt, and I have the privilege today to be joined by Jessica Landa with Boeing for what's going to be a very exciting and dynamic morning. That's right, Dan. It's an absolute pleasure to be out here with you. So you're going to have those launch abort engines ignite. Those LAEs are going to fire for about five seconds. Those OMAX are going to continue to fire intermittently for another five seconds. And that just gets the spacecraft uh, in the right trajectory. Um, and then just this is all going to go pretty fast. Before you know it, uh, the spacecraft is going to start to do its pitch around mover, maneuver, which gets itself in the proper orientation to land. You're going to see that ascent cover and that forward heat shield jettison together, followed by the parachute sequence two drogue parachutes, uh, followed by three pilot parachutes. That's jobs are really just to bring out the mains 
Um, and then you're going to see three main parachutes deploy. And really, you know, parachutes are really pulling double duty here because not only are they designed to bring the crew module safely and slowly back down to the ground, but they're also being jettisoned at the proper time or deployed at the proper time to, to make sure the spacecraft is in the proper orientation to properly separate that service module from the crew module. But like I said, you want to keep your eyes on that crew module because that's where, our, of course, our precious cargo is. Uh, about 60 seconds into flight, that base heat shield is going to jettison, and that allows for those gorgeous landing airbags to deploy. You know, keep in mind here, Starliner is going to be the very first uh, American-made orbital crew capsule to land on land, and you're going to get a bit of a preview of that today. We got nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Lift off. Pro complete. How many cut off? On track. Omec cut off. Pitch around. Yes, yes. And this parachute. is what they did. SpaceX and Blue Origin run rings around them. Now, see, see the three parachutes? These are the drogues. The SM service cut. modules eje uh, ejected here. Now that's full of hyperbolic fuel, by the way. We'll see, we'll see that in a minute. <laughs> And, lo and behold, two parachutes. What happened to the third one? Well, as luck would have it, someone left the pin out of the drogue that pulls out the third chute. This is serious. Two main this is a real, real issue. BC shield jettison. Now, they showed that they could land Airbags on two chutes. They could actually land on one. But, uh, after all the drama on uh, certifying these capsules and all the talk about parachutes, I left the pin out. TM touchdown. That was phenomenal. Initial indication is that, that orange, we've had a very um, successful paddleboard test. That today. orange hypergolics is not a really good thing either. Anyway, so so that was Boeing's. Now, of course, NASA and everyone called it a success. Why wouldn't you? That's like when um, Gus Grissom lost his uh, lost his capsule. <laughs> that was still a success, though. Uh, this is another view of this. I don't know how long this thing goes for. Two, one, zero. This is a better view. Lift this off. is a raw image. Roll complete. How about you cut off? I'm out. Pretty impressive, though, the manoeuvring that they do. SpaceX That's do the same. Set. Orion Capsule does exactly the same. A lot of manoeuvring on an abort uh, situation. All right, moving on. Um, I don't know. That's a good question. We should look up the recent mission, you know, uh, from a couple of years back. So it travelled at more than 1,000 kilometres an hour. It peaked at about 1,350 metres was declared uh, a success. Um, pin was the problem in the parachutes. Pretty crazy. There it is. And some of the team. And here it is moving. Moving to the pad for its... Um, I've got another one. This is the orbital version OF-T1. And... There's the Atlas. The Atlas was uh, being taken um, at the time to the pad. Uh, it's the first Atlas to fly without a fairing, actually. I didn't know that. And it's the first to use a dual engine Centaur upper stage. Didn't know that as well. The exploration upper stage for the uh, SLS is meant to have four engines on it. Uh, but they've got to develop that. Anyway, moving on. This is it being raised into position. There you have it. So, on the 17th, 
this will go to the space station, like demonstration mission number two, which SpaceX did a while back. All right, now SpaceX. That's DM-1, very successful mission. They're the two astronauts that are going up on demonstration mission two. <laughs> Um, December 19, Crew Dragon in flight abort. Interestingly enough, CST-100, SpaceX had to do uh, a ground abort and an inf they have to do an in-flight abort. Boeing only have to do uh, a ground abort. They don't have to demonstrate an in-flight abort. I don't know why that is. No one's ever explained it to me, but... And they got a lot more money. Um, and they left the pin out of a parachute drogue. Anyway, December, uh, we probably may have a in-flight abort. It's looking doubtful now. We've not heard any more news, so I suspect that'll go into the new year. And then early to mid, you'll find the crew dragon to the space station. So um, there it is. That's the sort of, they're the super dracos on the side of the, uh, of the Crew Dragon, that's uh, Gwyn Shotwell, she's the CEO of uh, SpaceX, uh, talking about, and she was basically saying, I mean, if you hear it from Elon, you kind of say, oh, well, there's Elon again. But when you hear it from her, you start to wonder, but talking about uh, getting to the moon uh, in um, 2022. I find that a hard to believe time timeline, but that's, if she starts to say it, then there's maybe an element of uh, truth. Here's the test that they did recently. This was the one that last time they did this, it blew up. <laughs> this time it worked. So this, they're, they're still analysing data, uh, but I've not heard any bad comments, which means it'll lead probably into the uh, in-flight abort. Now, parachute testing. SpaceX have, because they copped, a, copped it in the neck over parachutes, they have gone all out to develop new techniques, new algorithms, new everything. They've had 13 consecutive successful tests of these, what they call the Mark. They weren't all Mark III parachutes, but this is now the latest iteration of parachutes, and uh, they look very, very reliable. If you remember the demonstration mission number one, when they came down, the parachutes, to me, looked a little bit erratic. And uh, I think uh, it didn't go unnoticed at NASA's end. So uh, these worked well. They, there's only three, but uh, if you know, the uh, Crew Dragon actually has four when they actually um, come down. They can actually land on two, I believe. So that worked well. Now, um, how much time have I got? I've only got 10 minutes. I don't know if I'll race through this. SLS, um, they're building two launch pads, one to cater for Artemis 1 and to cater for this rocket, which will be Artemis 2, the Block 1B. And uh, this uses a cryogenic upper stage, one engine. This will use a four engine cryogenic upper stage, called the Exploration uh, Upper Stage. Really but um, oh, probably Boeing <laughs> and, and, and co. Uh, in fact, they've ordered 10 of these rockets off Boeing. So there's not been a competition, no nothing. Just goes that way. And um, Blue Origin offered uh, to develop an alternative upper stage for the SLS. And uh, what they were going to use, instead of using the RL-10 engines, which are, you know, I mean, they're very good engines. They've, they've gone for years, since the 60s. However, they offered the BE-3U, upper stage version of the BE-3, and it was pretty much rejected. Um, basically, they said it was uh, uh, the SLS too small to fit into the v, VAB. Um, S, SLS would have been too big, too tall to fit into the VAB and uh, would need modifications and all the rest of it. And NASA concluded, no, nah, can't use it. I could believe some of that. That's probably right. This is the path of minimum resistance. Keep with what you got and try to aim for 2024 moon landing. Um, this is how the SLS main stage is broken down into the oxygen, hydrogen and the aft section. And there it is as of the other day. They've got the four, 
Those engines are the RS 25s. They are the one of the best engines ever made. They're reusable. They're going to fly this thing and they're going to drop them into the Atlantic. Gone. They flew each probably 15 flights in space shuttles. It's tragic. There will not be an RS-25 in any museum at the end of this, um, this program, which is quite tragic, really, because when they were developing the Constellation and all the rest of it, a lot of the engineers went back and looked at the old F-1 engines and all the technology that was in them, and we'll lose these. I don't know who made that call. We'll see what has happened over the last few months in Artemis. We're getting a very delayed sound. That's the oxygen tank. This is in uh, Michoud in Louisiana, just outside of New Orleans. Really? Where did they put it? Ah. It'll be pretty amazing to watch the SLS go up because you'll have four uh, shuttle main engines and plus you'll have two upgraded solid rocket boosters on either side. But it is all shuttle derived technology and unfortunately it's all expendable. Throw it in the ocean. Yes. They're chucking them as well. Unbelievable. Anyway, keep moving. This is another one, similar thing, so I won't go into this one. It's exactly the same. Orion, there it is, ready to go to the new Armstrong Centre in Ohio for its shake tests and its radio frequency testing and all sorts of things. It has, yes. Uh, lunar exploration. Uh, I did have something on the spacesuits, but I won't play that now because I want to keep going to... SpaceX. Um, Boeing announced a quick version of getting a lunar lander on a Block 1B rocket and landing straight on the moon. In other words, bypass the gateway. Funny how they come up with that solution. Uh, yeah. Look, if you're going to get on the moon, I don't know why they're still insisting on this gateway. Um, you know, if one was sceptical, one might think it's job for the boys, but... I'm not a sceptic, so I wouldn't believe any of that. Um, you're absolutely right. That's why, if you notice, if you notice, the, the old Apollo service module is twice the size of the European module. And it's all designed to have this lunar gateway. And uh, yeah. yeah, but the but the advantage the advantage of doing it this way has some merit, and it's to do with uh, uh, polar orbits, right? Uh, to build a spacecraft to, to get into polar orbit requires something really quite large, and you can come around that with a gateway tug solution. But it is more complicated. There's no doubt about it. High risk. Anyway, so uh, they've added more people into what's called the CLIPS program. Uh, and this time they've added uh, Sierra Nevada, who incidentally, uh, sorry, Cirrus Robotics, Sierra Nevada, uh, TIVAC, Blue Origin, who incidentally has got their Blue Moon Lander 
and they've just uh, teamed up with uh, Lockheed Martin. So that'll be an interesting uh, group. And then we've got SpaceX, who is offering uh, uh, Starship, basically, to land 100 tonnes on the moon. Pretty good, if you can do it. So they're in the, in the loop now. There's Blue, Blue Moon, and there's a Lockheed Martin version. Um, they're, also, they're also talking about a lunar rover, and they want to get a unpressurised lunar rover back to the moon in 2024. But they're still going to be working on the pressurised version. And you'll see, if you go up to Kennedy Space Centre, you'll see that there's, or even uh, Houston maybe, there, there is a pressurised thing with vehicle with wheels that keeps roaming around the, the traps. And, uh, but they want to develop both. Um, geez, it's, it reminds me of the 60s, Len. <laughs> and there is, um, that looks like a gateway. Oh, this was a... What's the time? No, I better keep moving. This is... Vibe, they're going to launch uh, a little uh, robotic rover to sample water in the, uh, in the southern poles of the moon to just confirm so they know where they're going to land. SpaceX. All right, very quickly. Um, I always like these pictures, but anyway. That's a Falcon Heavy, for those that don't know. Starlink, I'm not going to show that, but that was... Uh, Fourth time the booster was used and pinpoint landing, beautiful landing, launched another uh, 60 plus Starlink satellites and all the astronomers are all up in arms at the moment and you know they've got uh, the observatories pictures and then you've got a, a train of 60 satellites just <coughs> uh, you know ruining all their photographic plates so uh, I sympathise and <laughs> this is only the tip of the iceberg. Now a strike when the iron is 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 hot. Uh, he's he. Ha, I mean, he sacked his first board, who said he could. They couldn't launch these satellites in time, so he sacked them all, and he's getting ahead of the game. First in best dressed, a la Electron. You know, first in best dressed, and you corner that little market. Yeah, he reckons he needs. Um, I forget the number, but it's a small number before he starts in the U.S. Correct. It's a great idea. I mean. Hopefully it's uh, economic and we can all benefit from it. Uh, general, we all know these things are all happening. Um, and there it is, that's the Mark I sitting at uh, Boca Chica and that was uh, for his presentation in September. And he just stacked it together, then he pulled it apart, ready for further testing. Uh, yeah, well, now, the landing sequence is something to be seen. Have a look at this. This is the... Uh, landing profile, beautiful. Look at this. This I gotta see. <laughs> and he'll be landing it at sea. So I look forward to that. <laughs> um, and there he is on Mars. Star Hopper, I'm not gonna show you that, but have a look at that for the legs, just to give you a bit of a, a feel for size. It's a huge thing that they, they launched. I won't show you the video. It's good to watch. Uh, it only goes up to how high was he going to go? Uh, 300 metres? I forget. This is what I wanted to show you. The other day, there it is, sitting there. Um, you can see on the top, you've got a bulkhead. You've got all these uh, horizontally welded uh, um, sections, and you've got the 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 fins, the movable fins. And this is what people saw. Because everyone's got their cameras on this all the time. But there they were, bang. Um, the whole of the top of the dome pressure vessel just popped off. And there it is landing on the ground. Now, keep going here. Please keep going. Welcome to this breaking episode of SpaceX in the News. I'm Kevin, and just hours ago, SpaceX's Mars rocket prototype knocked itself out of the race when it prematurely blew its load. <laughs> so earlier this week, the Mark I prototype underwent its first leak check to test the fuel tanks in preparation for a 20 kilometer flight that was supposed to take place by the end of the year. And from what everybody could tell, it must have went well. 
Most likely the tanks were filled with nitrogen or helium gas during pressurization, and at which time the controlled venting could be seen coming out of the vessel. And it was even noted that the rocket's dimps were smoothed out because of the pressure. That too was expected. Then following the test, SouthPadre.com noticed crews spraying down the body with an unknown substance for an unknown reason. But everything must have gone according to plan. Because today, SpaceX filled the top tank with liquid cooled oxygen for another pressure test. But this time, the top bulkhead blew completely off the rocket and of course outspilled enough oxygen to make everyone in Boca Chica high on life. You can check out the entire situation over on Lab Padres. I heard that was nitrogen. Elon then quickly addressed the situation by tweeting that SpaceX will move on to the Mark III prototype down there in Boca Chica, where they will implement the necessary changes to fix the problem, and he also said that Mark III will have a different flight design. Well, that does it for this breaking news episode. Make sure you check back this weekend for episode six. Okay, I heard that was nitrogen. Had it been oxygen, one spark, and that whole thing would have boom, gone in a in a big, big burst. This was the little release. Here you go. Um, I, I, he's pretty good. I watch him and, of course, Scott Manley. Scott Manley's uh, second to none, but he's pretty good. I, I enjoy watching his stuff. And then, of course, there was a SpaceX comment, as usual, just fob it off. The purpose of today's test was to pressurise the system to the max, so the outcome was not completely unexpected. In other words, just, you know, till it bursts, probably. There were no injuries, nor... Is this a serious setback? As Elon tweeted, Mark 1 served as a valuable manufacturing pathfinder, but flight design is quite different. The decision had already been made not to fly this test article, and the team is focusing on Mark 3 builds, which are designed for orbit. So, there you go. Amazing what happens when something blows up. So he didn't really intend to send this into orbit. By the way... Um, there was something on Twitter tonight where the bits of metal there might be used in the Cybertruck. So if you buy a Cybertruck, you might, <laughs> you might be... I'm serious. I'm serious. Everyday astronaut uh, Tim Dodd suggested that to Elon on Twitter, and Elon said, yeah, sort of, good idea. Take it on board. He's just as likely to do it. Uh, this is what Boca Chica will look like. Uh, it's developing at an incredibly fast pace. Mike told me, and I don't know if this is right, Mike, but uh, he's trying to buy everybody's properties around there for about three times the market value. Don't know what the market value is, and a lot of people are resisting. Um, so it be interesting what he does. It might go from three times to six times. But um, clearly the insurance cover for this would be well worth his while to buy everybody out, no matter what it costs. Because the FAA are going to drive him crazy down here. Uh, that's what it's going to look like eventually when they start to launch. Oh, this actually looks like a Falcon Heavy, but they're not going to launch Falcon Heavies from Boca Chica, as far as I can tell. Coco Beach. That's where the Mark III, I think it's Mark II. Can anyone correct me? Mark II or three? This is one of these orbital class um, starships that are being built. And you'll notice here, just appeared the last few days, these carrier trays, because they have to carry from here across the Banana River into um, launch pad 39A, right? So it's, it's going to be transported by land. This will be something to see. Nine metre tube, I forget how many metres long, so it'll be good to see. There it is. A lot happening at Coco. There are the rings uh, for the Mark IV potentially. There it is. No doubt they'll be checking all the wells up here. There were some good articles on Twitter from ship manufacturers saying you don't build stuff like this. But anyway, I'm sure their engineers know what they're doing. <laughs> Tongue in cheek, Len. These, I don't know, I don't know. Interesting though, and I haven't got to the bottom of this, they're scrapping rings. They've been cutting rings up uh, over the last week. And this actually happened before the explosion of Mark 1. And nobody quite knows why they're scrapping rings. Yeah, I know, but there's stories about spiral welding and there's all sorts of stories going around as how they manufacture these things. So anyway, stay posted. There's still a mystery out there. All right, I think we're done. All right, that's it. Oh, that's the launch pad at 39A getting built. There it is, right there. Right next to 39A. Done. 
back there as well. Sorry? They're eventually going to land back there as well. Yeah. On that pad. That's no, your... I think it was from the side. I, I, I heard that. Oh, so. I heard that. That's how you recycle them. I find that hard to believe. Anyway, that's just a nice picture. All right, we're done. Thank you.